Am I sticking at 20 minutes? We're five minutes over now. Are we going to... No, no, it's fine. We're actually five minutes early. Oh, are we? So, yeah, okay, right. Worry, Good. We're going to give them bags of time, so don't worry. <clears throat> Okay, response to the session theme, looking at uh, social bodies and skeletons and bones and bodies, I wanted to present to you some of my research um, that's part of a just concluding ERC-funded project called The Past and Its Place, which looks at a range of intersections between landscape and ancient monuments and stories. And um, I want to focus, I uh, will get to, I will finally get to by the end part of this presentation, um, the quite striking and iconic heritage site that you can see in this photograph. Um, and if you haven't guessed, it's Wayland Smithy, um, um, historically um, within Berkshire, now in Oxfordshire, on the uh, Berkshire Ridgeway, near to a cluster of other famous prehistoric monuments. Um, but my paper title about Wayland's Bones, Skeletons and Stories in Early Medieval Britain, is an attempt to chart the intersections between archaeology and literature and thinking through the stories created around bones and bodies. <clears throat> and to just to give you a sense, I'm not a, 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 a physical anthropologist or bioarchaeologist or whatever you want to call it. Uh, my focus is very hands-off in terms of the actual bones, but I think this is very much a, about materiality. This is hands-on for early medieval people as they would be engaging with this kind of, um, this, this kind of story. This is a, a story that would have prompted and disturbed. It would have been the equivalent of an early medieval horror story in many ways, um, um, although that is misleading in other regards. And um, while I disagree with the use of trigger warnings, uh, the images are not disturbing, but the content might be. Um, and hopefully that will be enough to keep you interested uh, through the next 20 minutes. <laughs> Ever mentioned tri trigger warnings? Immediately the Daily Mail will descend with SWAT teams to talk about... We've already mentioned health and safety gone mad, so we might, as well, we might as well get that one in as well. OK, so Wayland. This is a famed story about a famed smith. And it's touched on archaeology in a variety of ways. We know the story of Wayland from the Poetic Edda um, by Snorri Sturluson. Uh, so Icelandic story, the Leo Volander, his uh, Norse uh, equivalent name. We also know that f only from fragmentary references in a range of Anglo-Saxon sources of the 10th and 11th century that this story is way, way older. Or stories, because there may have been many stories of Wayland that were circulating, adapting through the late 1st millennium AD. We know it from a series of allusions to famed ob ob objects that were, of, um, that were made by Wayland or of a quality that meant they could have been worn by Wayland, that he's associated with serpents, he's associated with being uh, the story of his imprisonment and his, his escape to do with those themes. And of course, famously, in his translation of Boethius's Consolidation of Philosophy, King Alfred of Wessex... Um, um, poses, transforms the question to where are now the bones of that wise and famous goldsmith Wayland, where are the bones of Wayland now and who knows now where they may be, um, which suggests an awareness of Wayland in, in Germanic mythology as an equivalent to a, um, a smith, but also someone whose bones, someone famed for all of the artefacts or the products of his smithy, his bones are lost. This is about futility of remembrance, a theme that comes and goes throughout Western philosophy for the next thousand years, uh, but is here reflected on in an Anglo-Saxon context, with Wayland being the famed individual whose bones are absent. Um, Hannah Sackett and myself have been trying to translate some of these the story of Wayland into a cartoon which you can purchase from the Christmas market across the, across the way, um, where we try to, for, for children's perspective, try to deal with this quite uh, uh, disturbing story um, with a, a little narrative, and you can check it out on her website as well. Now, the important point to say is that from my perspective, Wayland's story is a means of exploring the intersections between literature and archaeology in the early Middle Ages, and its significance isn't simply about smithing, it's about bones and the significance of bones in placemaking, storytelling, and the constructions of a, a sense of personhood for the smith himself and the people he interacts with um, in that elite world of the, of the legendary story. The story or stories is not about a feigned elven smith and his treasures, as almost it, it, it repeatedly archaeologists take that as the principal uh, entry point of archaeology into the story. It's about a cyborgian identity of an anti-hero, a person who's known through an ex the products that he makes and the products that, uh, that fulfil um, various roles in, in long-going stories. So his identity is connected indelibly to his smithy as a space of work 
and to the various things that he manufactures there. Um, he's, he's associated with fiery transformation. He transforms into a bird or um, into, in his, through his flying, flying machine. In later versions of the story, he, he is captured while lying on a bare skin rug. So there's an earth sign connection. And his eyes are seen as serpentine. So he has many other dragon-like qualities to him as a person who may be hoarding treasures um, in a barrow, as we find in Beowulf, famously. So there's lots of um, different associations there and that for he's a person that transcends different elemental realms he's aerial he's subterranean and in a later story from Thedric Saga he's submarinal as well he, he builds a submarine so we have this idea of a whale and transcends different realms but primarily and quite candidly the, the amazing how Anglo-Saxon scholarship and Norse scholarship has, has managed to sort of circumvent the simple narrative that he's primarily a murderer and a rapist and that's the, the key Elements I think is important from an archaeological perspective, and there's there's a whole separate spin-off study I want to pursue with colleagues about how, particularly the rape denial or the use of the way he's he's a seducer um, is the term that's used in most of the literature, but he is actually a, a, a rapist by any any representation, and certainly from an early medieval perspective, that is one of the key dimensions of his identity as a legendary character, and his story is therefore about the breaking and making of bodies and bones. This is another image from Hannah's uh, artwork to, to underpin that. The words aren't from the, uh, any sources there, hit her simplification to give you a sense of one of the key stages in the story. And the story is simply, uh, I will reduce down very simply for those of you who aren't familiar. He's one of three brothers who uh, they're married to Valkyries. The two other brothers uh, go after the Valkyrie wives that, uh, that disappear, swan maidens. Um, he is subsequently captured, imprisoned, hamstrung by a king, Nidad. Um, he exacts revenge by slaying the two sons of the king, and he does so in a particularly distinctive way, and that's, that's important to remember. He decapitates them, burying their heads in the bellows pit of the smithy, and makes jewels from their heads, drinking vessels from their skulls, beads from their eyes, and brooches from their teeth. He basically disassembles their heads to create treasures, and the treasures are not just then manufactured by Wayland, he uses them as gifts to give back to the king. So that, that's, the, that's the point. You don't just kill these, you actually return as body parts, mafia style, the various elements of that person's identity. He then intoxicates and rapes the king's daughter, um, and, and thus be, uh, in the smithy again, all this happens in the smithy, and thus giving the king another gift. Not, he gives the sons back in, in bits as, as precious objects, and he gives the, the daughter back pregnant with his child. So the, the, the gift is a grandson of his creation for the king to realise his blood line has been has been surpassed supplanted um Whelan then builds a flying machine to first escape from his island to go and tell the king that he's done all these things because there's no point in doing these things if you don't then inform the king that what, all the grisly things you've done to his children and then flies away going na 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 well not exactly that but that equivalent you know so he flies away and that's the end of the layer of volume now, the thing is, archaeology has long played. Material culture has been a key role to this story um, because we wouldn't have put whale, the whale stories far back at the 8th century if we didn't have this whalebone casket and pride of place in the British Museum known as the Franks casket because after, after the curator Franks. Um, and it's, it's argued to be an early 8th century Northumbrian product <coughs> and key to its materiality, I think it's key to the story, is that this is a whalebone casket. This is retrieved from a, a shore and is made of whalebone. And it juxtaposes famously the adoration of the Magi um, and a duck or goose. Um, who we, There's different discussions of why there's a birdie in that particular scene. There's, there's JC and Mary. And on the other side you've got Wayland in his smithy in the act of giving the, what's thought to be the king's daughter a, a, a drug to drink, a, 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 some mead, and here's the various elements of the, the, the scene around him. We're not sure the relationship between these two women, uh, maybe a, another element of the story we've lost. In his tongs, he seems to hold a head, and there is a body laying beneath his feet, perhaps the other king's son. So you've they've condensed down elements of the story, juxtaposing the giving of gifts to the Christ child with the giving of um, a cursed gift, of, of drink, of mead, to, to lead to his revenge. And they have various other material manifestations of the Wayland story on um, early medieval objects that show us the diversity and the geographical expanse of the story is alone, known and the different ways it's manifest. So we have the Ardra stone, got Lundic picture stone, we have the smithy, headless bodies and tools outside at the back and a flying Wayland coming out um, um, into the back of a woman um, which has been seen as him flying off 
with uh, with uh, with the, the the king's daughter. So something doesn't happen in the the known literary story, but I've got a different view of that. And here, the fa- uh, famous recent discovery, Apocra in southern Sweden, of Wayland in his flying machine, seemingly, um, and maybe uh, uh, an application for a shield or a helmet or or, or horse gear. It's thought. Um, here we have a, a Wayland depicted in his flying machine, transforming himself. He's a self-made man. That's the whole point. He transforms himself. And this also appears on northern uh, on Viking Age sculpture. And this is uh, another side project which I'm trying to suggest is we've completely misinterpreted the scene, partly because it's been brought together by fragments wrongly. Um, and, and this is the 19th century reconstruction of these fragments. That's the Ardra scene from Scotland. This is the different bits we know from the English and that's a composition by Jim Lang of what the scene may have once been, which I think is misleading. And if you look back at the original stone, and it may not be clear, this is the, this is the lady in question, and this is the whole stone in fragments on the, the Leeds Cross, you can see in the Minster Church there. And my point about this is that here we see Wayland in a flying form, but he's not flying off romantically with the king's daughter. He's, this is a stylized version of a rape scene. And the, what you've, the, 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 daughter, the, the woman is being held by her pigtails, by the trails of her skirts, and bitten around the midriff by this beak of, 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 of Wayland while she's in the process of self-intoxication with a long drinking horn that she's holding and imbibing in the act. So I think this is a simplification of, if you want to call it seduction, fine, but a, a violent, um, um, a non-consensual sex, if you want to call it that. And I, therefore, I think that for early medieval audiences, that is the story here of Wayland coming out in a flying, uh, in, as a raptor, and consuming this woman's form. Um, now, that kind of, those kind of manifestations lead us to Wayland Smithy and help us to understand this, how the story and place relate. This isn't just any um, folkloric place name. This is a very specific place name and a very specific connection to a very particular monument. And therefore, we need to ask the question, how did Wayland get associated with this monument? And why is it Smithy? Well, we have demonstrable evidence this is not a later folkloric association. This goes back to 10th century Charter Bounds. The Waylander Smither is recorded in the Compton Bochon Bounds of AD 955. And it, it describes it along the furrow until it comes to the wide gate east of Wayland Smithy. Um, so we have that association. There are also a couple of other place names that Leslie Grinsall suggested may also be associated with um, the story of Wayland mapped out on the landscape. Um, this is not, not everyone agrees with this, but you have a Whittet's plough, the burial mound of Whitter, who's the son of Wayland, and you have um, Beergel's, um, a Beerhilda's Beergel with the burial of Beerhild, the, 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 the king's daughter, who is seduced. So you may have a topographical story here mapped out in multiple locations. Um, and I think the answer to this is quite simple, and it comes from what I've been saying about the nature of the story and how it would have been understood by Anglo-Saxon elites in oral communication. Is that this is all about the materiality, and, and, and I think this has been missed by scholarship, because archaeologists dealing with Wayland's myth have focused on his metalworking and his treasure, and have seen him as a smith rather than as a murderer and, or a rapist. Um, The archaeology is a memory dealing with this association. Well, Sarah Semple's excellent book from 2013, uh, Oxford University Press, can't really tackle this because she's looking at a a national scale at all the more common supernatural name associations. And Wayland is is quite rare. rare. It's almost unique. It's only a couple of allusions to Wayland. And from her perspective, it's not a weakness of her study. It's 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 the strength of her study that she systematically looked at all the place name evidence for supernatural associations with barrows in the Anglo Saxon landscape. And Wayland is just, is just one of many. And I don't think we can just see it as yet another demonic toponym. I think we have to think about what specific stories may have been associated with this monument. And as far as I'm aware, I haven't exhaustively gone through all of the work on the Berkshire Ridgeway, but at least from what I've read so far, um, there's been no particular engagement with this monument. Attention has been drawn elsewhere in terms of field work and interpretation. And Wayland Smithy is just sat there um, gathering dust. So why was this monument called Wayland Smithy? Well... Um, Ellis Davison said he, um, that Alfred, when he was doing, he writing his Consolidation of, uh, um, of, of um, Philosophy version of Boethius, he may have been imagining uh, there was a, 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 an association with Wayland and this site already. But um, this suggests, I, I, don't think, I think we can go further than this. I don't think this is quite adequate to say that Alfred was just an antiquarian responding to uh, sites in his landscape. Um, and this is not his tomb, this is not Wayland's tomb, this is not about Wayland's bones. 
Um, the folklore is of an invisible smith at Wayland Smithy, um, and Snivelling Corner is a stone which was thrown at his apprentice. So we have a long tradition of this. And, of course, we have a monument antiquarian literature shows. has been obviously reconstructed in recent times, but has been an enduring distinctive feature of the um, Ridgeway landscape. And I would suggest that this is all from the nature of the archaeology of Wayland Smithy. The Iron Age currency bounds, bars have been found there, and perhaps ones were found in the past. We have evidence that um, um, there may be um, some actual activity in the Roman period at Wayland Smithy. The idea that it was uh, just disrespect that Atkinson suggested, uh, and, and Hutton recent, has recently reiterated, I don't, I don't quite believe. There's over 70 shards of RB pottery, and as well as Iron Age pottery, and also possibly burials. We have ditches cut with human remains in it, and we have a single grave that could be Roman or later. So I suspect there's more going on at Wayland Smithy that would prompt any Anglo-Saxon audience to see an association of the site, not only with metal working, um, but megalithic architecture, but also disarticulated human remains. And it just, it, it's a, the obsession we have with archaeological categorisation, which so many people have critiqued again and again, and tagged for the last... 40 years and yet still when we look at a site like this we say oh the Anglo-Saxons if they encountered bones like this would see this as a funerary deposit well in the story of Wayland perhaps not perhaps these are the bones of Wayland's victims that may be the story of any dis chance discovery of disarticulated human remains at this site so my point is um, sort of slowly reaching conclusion um, is that this is not Wayland's tomb. The place name evidence and the story doesn't talk about Wayland's tomb. Ellis Davison is, 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 and that is not on the right lines there with that interpretation. This is a place that would have been imagined in the early medieval mind as a place of, of work, of artisanship, of the creation of precious objects, a place of killing, a place of sex, and the transformation of death, uh, of, of heads into artefacts and of aerial flight. So the story can become wrapped around these material traces. We don't know how many of these were actually found in the Anglo-Saxon period. What I am suggesting, though, is that the materiality of the site um, may have prompted a, um, a, a, a specific association with the story. Was Al Alfred actually employing a double entendre? Were the bones of Wayland and the mortar remains alone, or his, or his treasures, in a metaphorical sense, or the bones of his victims, if there was actually seen to be a difference, because the treasures are made from bones? So was the materiality and corporality of Wayland Smithy the real inspiration for the attribution? Dis disarticulated bones, old metal, megalithic architecture. And I suggest this isn't just a Wayland Smithy, this would have become the Wayland Smithy. Um, this is a famous and infamous landmark on the edge of a cluster of prehistoric monuments and on a key um, in, in regional and inter-kingdom routeway through the early medieval landscape and thinking all the work that Andrew Reynolds and Alex Langlands have done, Stuart Brooks and John Baker on, on mapping Anglo-Saxon civil defence and mapping assembly sites and beacon sites we have to think about a landscape where knowledgeable agents are mapping and naming features and they've been aware of these features over long distance there were points on long distance uh, overland communication routes connected to this cluster of famous early medieval sites, but on the, on the skyline from them, of uh, prehistoric sites, but on the skyline from them, but perhaps part of a Christianised mythological landscape, um, close to a gate on the ridgeway, controlling movement and memory, and associated with perhaps a series of uh, legendary toponyms, including other features like the White Horse itself and Grimm's Ditch, which may have had serpentine associations linked to the Wayland story. This was a, a landscape of conflict too. And it would have been a key node in the overland communications. This wasn't been simply about the, the Christianised mythology of Wessex, but also Wessex promoting itself beyond to its neighbours as they're consolidating and expanding their, their kingdom. So the Wayland Smithy att uh, attribution is not simply a story in the landscape, a folkloric association. It's a part of political propaganda and an ideology of mapping out and using, mobilising ancient monuments to articulate both fear and pain and terror within these landscapes of power. So I'll leave it there and to give you an example here where how we're trying to, you can start thinking about the archaeology from a different perspective, a different starting point, looking at the story from a different perspective, this intersection between archaeology and literature um, can be engaged with in a slightly different way than has been done so before. Thank you very much. Thank you.